today of salesmen, at least our world. And even the history books are written with so much bias that you have to read 50 different histories to where you find out what really happens. I'm going to give you an example of that tonight. How many of you ever heard of Sir Francis Drake? What did Sir Francis Drake do? He sailed around the world. He sailed around the world. He circled <coughs> the whole world in a sailing ship. But what did he do? What, what kind of a person was he? I don't think he was a very nice person, was he? <clears throat> now, that's a real good <laughs> estimate. He wasn't a very nice person. Do you know what he was? This young man right here. Pirate? Here, you are right. He was a pirate. Or in the English he was a pirate. View, he was a pirate. Now, I, I want to... You know, understand, as we studied, we studied the King James Version and all this, and I told you the history of the, the, of the English uh, seagoing vessels and Sir Francis Drake that the Queen of England had hired. Now, actually, Sir, Sir Francis Drake, he was Francis Drake before. He took off in a ship called the Pelican. And you know what he was supposed to do? He was supposed to, he was supposed to be a pirate. The Queen of England backed him up, and England backed him up, and they, he went out and all he did was kill other, well, basically Spanish ships. He would, uh, would uh, uh, shoot them out of the water and, and uh, kill the people, string them up by the neck, run them through with a sword or whatever, and steal everything they had. He even started, <clears throat> he came to California and he went up and down the coast of California robbing every Catholic church he could rob. Even taking the golden crucifixes and everything. And, and he had so much silver and gold on the ship that was called the Pelican. And by the way, he named it the Golden Hind instead. He changed the name of it. You heard of the Golden Hind. All right. He changed the name of it, but the ship was bursting at its seams. I mean, it was leaking and sinking in the water. And they don't know where he went, into what California Bay or whatever for sure, but they think that he went into San Francisco Bay. And he hid out and repaired the ship. And while he was there, he called uh, uh, San Francisco and he claimed all of California and it was called New England. Now what coast do we have New England on today, really? That's the East Coast. <laughs> That's what we call New England. But the first New England was actually California. How many of you knew that? The first New England was California because Sir Francis Drake claimed all of California for England and called it New England. All right? He named it in Latin, but anyway, he called it New England. Yes, Terry? Uh, up by San Francisco, San Rafael? Yes. I was at school there, Sir Francis Drake High School. Mm -hmm. Why did they name it after him? <laughs> well, in, in history, if you read, especially when we, when we went to school, Sir Francis Drake was a great guy. He was even knighted by the king, by the Queen of England. You know, he was a great guy in history, but he really wasn't a great guy. He was a pirate. And uh, finally, uh, when Spain went, Philip II went against England at one time with all of his Spanish Armada and they were going to go and wipe out England and were going to take England back to Catholicism. And they had a couple of uh, uh, storms hit them pretty hard but when they got there then Sir Francis Drake he was coming in brother, good to have you in here. Sir Francis Drake when he, he got out there he had started a brand new type of naval warfare. And right over here young man, you can, right. can sit right here. I'll. Make a place for you. Thank you. He brought, a brand, brought into effect a brand new naval warfare. Before this time, he had designed ships completely different. Before this time, the ships set up high in the water. Here's a water line like this. You know the old Spanish Armada, the old Pentanita and the Santa Maria and all that kind of stuff. They were way up high, you know, like this. and water and they had to put a lot of ballast in them because they were some, such a high riding boat. And they had all these cannons in here like this, but they didn't use them very much. What they did at that time was they fought hand-to-hand -hand combat. They would lash the ships together and they'd get out there and find it out. Well, Sir Francis Drake, he dropped the boats down in the water like this to where they wasn't as much of a target to hit. 
they were lowering the water line, and then he put these guns in here, and they got them where they were accurate. Before, they hadn't been accurate at all. Well, he uh, engineered accuracy and the firing of these cannons and everything. And when they got out there, when, when the Spanish Armada came against the English Navy, the English Navy just act like they were running away from them. But what they were doing was they were getting them in their gun sights. Well, they thought they were afraid, so they kept chasing them around there. All of a sudden, they started firing on them. And pretty soon, there wasn't any more Spanish ships in the water. They'd all been blown, and they went down to Navy Jones' locker. They were all gone. And that's how the Spanish Armada... The, 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 the Spanish... Spain was the mistress of the seas, and all of the colonies all over, all over California, all of the plantations, uh, actually the slave plantations were called missions. Okay, all up and down California, there were slave plantations, what they were. And they had colonies all over the world. Well, after that naval warfare, after that war, England became the mistress of the sea, and they are still the mistress of the sea all over the world. That's how they founded all of their English colonies. All they did was go back and do exactly what Spain did, except that they didn't try to convert them, their people, that they, the Spain came in there and at, with a knife at the throat, you either become a Catholic or you're dead. We're going to baptize you or, we're gonna, or, or you're going to die, one or the other. And of course in California they did that and all the Indians in California were basically either run away, hiding out there from bullets, or else slaves on mission, in missions. And that's the way it was. Anyway, so that's history. As history really is, we don't always know it that way unless you study a lot of history books. The history of the United States of America is not exactly as we say it is. You have to read it from what France and from what England says and maybe even Russia and Cuba and Mexico. Uh, some of the people that have, have been on the other side. And then you read all those books together and then you might figure out what really happened. <laughs> Well, in this verse, it talks about this type of deception, okay? Intentional deception. Tuto, Lego, Hina, Medes, Himas, Paragit, Para, Para Logisete. My tongue was tied up. Pithana Logia. All right. And it says, Paul is saying, this I say in order that no one, not one person, that may days, so there it comes from may, day, and ace. All right? Ace is the numeral one. One, moreover, not one. Not one person. And then it says, ye, he may beguile. Now this word, para la gizete, this means to, to, intentionally mislead a person. It comes from the word to walk beside you and talk. That's what it means, para and logo, okay, or lego. It means to take facts and twist them up to where you are deceived. You are misled, you are hoodwinked, okay? Now the next term here is even worse than that term, all right? Being misled and, and, and lied to and uh, conned, that's what this word here, para logizete, means. Third person singular, presence of junk in middle. And then in pithana logia. And that word comes from pytho, or patho, and logos. Patho. Patho means passion. We get our word passion from this, all right, from this word. Now, <clears throat> if you've ever been in a courtroom, some of the worst liars and the most worst thugs are not in jail. They wear the, the, the name of uh, Esquire. <laughs> Lawyers. <laughs> now it was bad. It wasn't bad in, in the year, in the, the 21st century that we live in. It was bad in the 20th century, in the 19th and the 18th, and back in here in B.C. when this term was invented here. This is the winning arguments of champions of error, better known as lawyers. That's what this term here means. This is a lawyer's argument. 
This is a uh, is is to get up and make a fake speech, to appeal to your passions, to con you. Out of you know the other one there that meant to con you and beguile you also, but this one here means to touch your heart with words of, with lying words, to convince you to follow them and to touch your heart. That's what it means. Persuasive speech. Flashy oratory. Flashy oratory. To get up and to speak in a fluid, fluent language to beguile and deceive. To beguile and deceive passionately. To influence you. To pull your heartstrings to get you to make the wrong decisions. Alright, that's what that one means. 2 and verse 5. 2 and verse 5. Colossians 2 and verse 5. I thought I had to go back over that because that one was a very good verse with some very good words in it. And I knew you'd like them and those even a few that were here last week got to hear it again. And if you hear it again, repetition is the, uh, is the art of learning. Alright? Repeat, 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 repeat. Alright? It works. 2 and verse 5. A... Dar, Kai, Te, Sarki, Apema, Ala, To, Numati, Sin, Himen, Amy, Chiron, Kai, Blepon, Himon, Tain, Toxin, Kai, To, Sterema. Pace, Pace, Christol, Pistios, Simon. That's a long verse. The knowledge of the Godhead, the mysteries that are revealed in the nature of Godhead. We saw in 2 and 3 last week, in 2 and 2, we saw how. Arius of Alexandria got a little piece of his explanation of what the scriptures in there in the Latin Vulgate. It was put into the Latin Vulgate, and, and it, by the way, it got into Texas 7, Stephanus or Stephen's text. Uh, one of the, in the second chapter, even the first and the second chapter of the book of Colossians, Paul is driving hard home that God is Christ, and Christ is God. Christ was real deity. The Gnostics did not believe that. Arius of Alexandria did not believe that. We see that so much. Even Augustine, or you want to call him Augustine? You can do that if you want. But Augustine, <laughs> okay. Augustine, he wrote the city of God. And he is, uh, in a lot of ways, the father of the Presbyterians today. But Augustine was touched heavily with Gnosticism. And a lot of his writings uh, flavored was flavored with Gnosticism. And the idea of separating the triune God. Trying to... What is Gnosticism? Gnosticism are those people back at this period of time, Paul was dealing with them. Uh, the church at Coloss, Coloss Hierapolis, and... Um, think of a minute, <laughs> uh, Laodicea <clears throat> were heavily influenced by the Gnostic philosophy. Philosophers, they said that they had sacred mysteries that only they knew in their philosophy and uh, that they knew the mystery of God and that, and this is where, this is what got Augustine. He wanted to separate, he wanted to have a, a, a dualism in the world, <coughs> good and evil, all right? And evil is material and good is spiritual. And the Gnostics uh, tried to separate everything spirit from everything material. God died on the cross of Calvary. God tasted death that he might redeem what? John 3.16. Or God what? So, the so God so loved the cosmos, the whole world system, all of his material creation, that he died on the cross. All right? To redeem it all back to him. Okay? All of it. Material is not bad. But people try to 
make material evil. When Satan was over the material creation of God, for a while he served God. I don't know how long, but he did glorify God according to Ezekiel 28 and Isaiah 14. He did glorify God for a while. But then he went astray, pride uh, took him under, and he tried to, to overcome God. And who took his place over the material creation of God? That was not bad, still. Sin had, was in the universe, but man took Lucifer's place over the material creation of God. And God made that garden, and God reconstructed the earth, and God said it, Haya, became good. It changed from one state. It had become bad. It had become a chaos. But it became good. God set it straight again. And then Adam handed the the uh, title to Eve back to the material create of the material creation back to Satan when he sinned in the garden. Well, God is taking that title back. That title cost him everything. All right, cost him everything. Now he's going to buy it back. <clears throat> in space and time, in the person of Jesus Christ, he bought it back. But he's going to take it back over. At his, in his time. Agar Kai Te Sarke. Since. Now this word A here, how many kind of conditionals are there in Greek? What is a conditional? In English, we look at this conditional. Boy, that thing was ready to go off. <laughs> what is that? How many kinds of conditionals are there in Greek? How many classes of conditionals are there in Greek? No man, do you know how many classes of conditionals are in Greek? Four. Four classes of conditionals. All right, four classes of conditionals. Now the first class conditional is condition determined as fulfilled. Now when we say if in English, we think if it might be. But in Greek, the first class conditional is not if, but it should be translated since. It's already in fact. All right. It is a condition that's determined as fulfilled. All right. Gar, well, we have to start out with gar because that's a conjunctional particle here. All right. <coughs> For since. And then we have a little particle of affirmation. This word chi. This chi is a conjunction and particle of affirmation also. You can look at that one up on in Benjamin Davidson's Analytical Greek Lexicon on page 280 if you want to. It'll tell you a lot about chi. Right here it is a, uh, is a particle of affirmation which means yes or indeed. Okay? Indeed, for since indeed in the flesh, Locative singular, definite article there, take, and sarki in the flesh. And then it was a payme. A payme. First person singular, present indicative active. It comes from a, or apo and amy. What's amy? Amy, amy a Eston. Huh? It's, it's be from. To, to be. be off. I am. Be away. Yeah. From is, is away and to be. It means a way to be, or a way I am. That's literally what it is. Apo and Amy. Not here. Absent. Away from. All right? And th this is a good way to learn these words. Just literally see what they mean. Okay? Come from Ape and Amy. Uh, not present. I am absent. I'm not here. I am not there. I'm from to be. All right? And then Allah. Allah is a strong adversative conjunction. <clears throat> but. Strong adversity. But. This, it means do about face. I'm not here, but. To numati. But in the spirit. With ye. What is it? Amy. I am. Jim? Yes. You say that's Allah? That is Allah? Allah. Yeah. Well, you know, Allah, we li listen to what the, the Arabs say, that's their name for God. 
But this is a strong adversity to a junket. And by the way, you will see it with the, it, it'll, it'll sometimes it'll be <coughs> all instead of all. It'll be all. And that's for euphony. They'll drop it. They change the letters. Sometimes they change the letters to different, uh, in different verb forms, they'll change letters in, in the verbs. They'll, we saw one in the last verse where it was patho and it was peeth, peeth, all right, like a, just peetha. Well, here we have this, Allah, apeme Allah to. Now, the reason why it's Allah there, why you have that alpha on the end of that, is because it's a, it's, it's a uh, consonant, the next one. Now, if that would be a, a vowel that it started with, they would drop the alpha on the end of that. It would be all. But in the spirit with you, seen, that means with, that's a little, uh, we have it in English. Symphony, symphony, what does symphony mean? Huh? It comes from two Greek words. Orchestra, with sound, with sound. Together sound. A symphony is a together sound. Just think about that. Doesn't that make sense? Together sound. They play together. Of course, sometimes, you know, when they're tuning up, it doesn't sound like they're playing together. <laughs> <laughs> All right, it sounds like they're... <laughs> With ye I am. And then it says Cairo. Nominative, singular, masculine. Present participle active. It comes from Cairo. And that means uh, full of happiness. Happening. Happy. Being happy. Being full of grace, being in joy, rejoicing. I am rejoicing. In the spirit, I am rejoicing. And blepo, nominative singular masculine, present participle act to be done from blepo. Blepo means what? What is that? The little first person singular present negative back. What is that? See. I see. Blepo. So it means seeing. Seeing of ye tain toxin. What in the world is that toxin there? What is this? This is a military term. That's what it is. It's a military term. What kind of a military term is that? Now the Greeks had a front line. The front line of combat, they had a front line. They put some strong soldiers out there on the front line. But also, they did something that was very, uh, and even the Persians did this, the Babylonians. They had a front line that was they called indefeatable. Because if somebody stood right behind that person, and when one person fell in the front line, another person immediately took his place. So it was like it was an eternal front line. Okay, and that's this word. He said, I am very glad seeing of you the front line of your soldiering. That you are beginning to combat the error that is coming in your churches. I'm happy, he says. I'm rejoicing to see the order of your standing against error. And the kai to stere stereoma stereoma. What there, Jerry? What did you have a question? Oh, this toxin is that related to the word uh, taxonomy? That might be taxonomy, which is like an order of you putting concepts in an order. Yes, that would be an order. Thanks. It would be like a battle. When you put concepts in order, you really, you're really you trying to convince somebody of something. When you're fighting, you're trying to win them. Strategy. It's a kind of a term that we can use the word strategy with, but, but that word also comes from Greek also. Now we're going to find another word that comes, or another one of our words that comes from Greek here in just a moment. Kaito steroma. What word comes from this one? The firmness. 
I go to the doctor every now and then, he wants to give me a shot of steroids. What do steroids do to you? Huh? They, they make you strong. These guys, these, fo these football players, baseball players, and all of these people taking these illegal steroids, what are they doing? <coughs> They're pumping them up, themselves up. And all these weightlifters and bodybuilders and everything else, they like to cheat. So they take steroids, something to make them firm and hard and tough. Okay? Paul said, I'm glad you're being tough. You're full of steroids. <laughs> God steroids. <laughs> that you're full of God steroids. All right? That's <clears throat> it's that Ruma. You've got God steroids on your side. You, you've got the power of God in you, building you up with spiritual staying power. That you've got your front line in there, that you've got your orders from God, that you've got your marching orders. Yes? <clears throat> and, but is this word also related to the word for stand? Histamine? Mm. Uh, the, the sigma... Yeah, the histamine is what the, you're thinking about. That means to stand firm, the foundation, to stand. Histamine. Okay. All right. This means to make firm, to become strong. <clears throat> and then it says, taste ace Christo. The firmness of it that's in Christ because of Christ. Alright? In Christ and because of Christ. Where, where does our, where do our steroids come from? They come from Christ. Alright? Our strength comes from strife. Right. Now look at that. Taste ace Christone. Alright? Now ace is the it's just like eth in Hebrew. Eth is what in Hebrew? Well, how do you say the first verse in Genesis? Barashith Bara. Elohim. Hashemayim. Alright. In the first verse. That's good. <laughs> he says it good. You, you're, you're good in Hebrew. Barashith, bara, Elohim, eth, Hashemayim. We eth ha'aretz. Alright? Eth Hashemayim, eth eth. Eth, eth. That's the same thing. It's a sign of the direct object in Hebrew. Not That's only right. is it a sign of the direct object, it is the alpha and the omega of a Hebrew. All right, it's the first and the last letter of the Hebrew alphabet. All right? That's true. <clears throat> I forgot a lot of my Hebrew, but I remembered the important things. Eth, <laughs> <laughs> the sign of the direct object. Ace is like that. Right? Now, ace means extension or limitation of thought or verbal action. That is a grammatical explanation of ace, and that is from Greek, not English, not German or anything else. Extension or limitation of thought or verbal action. Sometimes it goes into something, and sometimes it comes out of something. We have to understand that. Sometimes it goes in that, and sometimes it comes out of, and right now here, our strength does not go in Christ, but it comes from Christ because of Christ. Okay? That's where it comes from. See the extension or limitation of thought or verbal action. Okay? The extension or limitation, forward or backwards, it's either because of something or unto something. Okay? But it's got the idea of action in it. Because it is a sign of action of the direct object. I'm trying to teach my beginners and my advanced students all at the same time. Okay? Tais ace Christone. Pistios Himon. Pistios. In English, we have a word piston. Piston. Do you know what a piston does, Dave? Scott, do you know what a piston does? It goes up and down. Huh? It goes up and down. It goes up and down in a hole, doesn't it? In a side of a block or whatever. And if that piston is too loose in that hole, it doesn't make any compression, does it? It has a piston to be worth something has to cling to the side of that cylinder. Okay? It's got to be close tolerance before it makes any compression at all. So it'll do any so it can communicate power to the crankshaft. Right? 
This word piston, I believe in English, is comes right out of Greek. And it means a clinging faith. It means a belief. It means to believe. But it means more than believe. It means to cling to with all your might. I remember I used to go, I lived in Nevada for about 15 years altogether. But <clears throat> I would go to a uh, physical therapy because my back and neck is horribly terrible shape. And I would go over there for physical therapy in Bishop, California. And, I, and in that office, when I'd go over there, I would... Uh, look up on the board, and it gave me great confidence because I saw this pelican out there swallowing a frog. And the frog had a hold of, it, its head was in there, but its arms were around the pelican's neck, strangling it, and it says, don't give up. <laughs> Is that what the captain said on the... Yeah. Don't give up. Yeah. Don't give up. That's this word, tisios. This is faith. Faithfully, clinging, intensely. Your clinging faith. It, I don't know if you've ever seen the movie Indiana Jones and the uh, yeah. Last Crusade. Yeah. He, now there's a guy that clings right there. I mean, he's always holding on. He's always grabbing and scaling back up a mountain after the mountain caves off. He was uh, on this big old tank and the tank went over the side of the mountain down this great deep cavern precipice there and his dad was out there and the other people out there that were out there and they just oh well, I wish you and your dad blah 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 and out there and his hat was laying on the ground you know in the end of Jones hat it was on the ground it wasn't on his head you know it hardly ever got off his head I don't care what well there be moaning and be wailing Indiana Jones and Junior. And he crawls up that thing like this. He's out here on the ground like this, just half dead. He crawls up to him. What are you doing? <laughs> he crawled back. He clung to the side of the mountain and climbed out of there. Clinging. That's the kind of faith this is talking about. Ephesians 2 and uh, 8. <coughs> Ephesians 2 and 8. Now, Jerry, are you around there anymore? 2 and 8. Ephesians 2 and 8. Book of Ephesians. Ephesians. Mm -hmm. Actually, it's a general epistle. It's not the book of Ephesians. I'm sorry, I was considering another matter in that verse. All right. Ephesians 2 and 8. Let's go there because this is a real good example of this word faith. Ephesians, right after the book of Galatians. Ephesians is the sister epistle to this one, probably written about the same time. The Ephesian epistle, or this general epistle, it became known as the Ephesian letter. Talks about the marriage of Christ to his church. Colossians, it talks about the deity of Christ. Now, he talks about the word faith, the faith of ye. Now let's go back in 2 and 8. Te gar carite este. Say so menoi. For in grace ye are having been saved. For in grace ye are having been saved. In grace. Submersed in it. That's the law we by the way. That's not in the instrumental case. It's in the lock. It's submersed in grace. You're having them say you're just engulfed in it. All right. In grace. All right. In grace, you are having been saved. Dia pistios. Here we have the same word. By the agency of, because of faith. And then it says, and this. This faith. This unction. Didn't come out of you. Not out of ye, but out of God. The gift. Faith didn't come from you either. Faith comes from God. There is nothing you can do to get saved. 
That is from God. It is a gift of God. It is by grace. For in grace ye are having been saved through faith, and the faith didn't come out of you. That's a flat, beautiful statement. God's grace, His calling to us, is a gift to us. It's something because He loves us. Because He loves you. He loved you in eternity past Him. firmness of Christ that comes out of Christ and the faith of you, yes. Um, can we take ace Christon as an adjective modifying the stale's one? So it would be the, um, the the firmness of the in Christ faith. Tells you what kind of faith it is. Well, the firmness comes from Christ. It comes from Him. It's because of Him and from Him. And the faith is of you, but the faith comes from... That's why we went back to 2 and 8. I'm just wondering if... Because all that originates in Christ, it turns back to you. It's, yeah. yeah. The origin of all of this is in Christ. Because of Him and from Him. I'm just wondering grammatically though, when you have when you have a the, mm -hmm. you have the faith and it's interrupted. It says the in Christ faith. Mm -hmm. Can we understand it then the the faith is, of ye in Christ that that's because of Christ it comes from Christ. Yeah, this this interruption, Ace Christone, mm -hmm. it does this serve as an adjective to modify. It tells you what kind. That's what I want. It tells you what kind, it tells you where it's from, from whence. Okay. And where it's from, it, it does. It does explains it. It's explanatory. And an adjective, what does an adjective do? It describes a noun. Mm -hmm. That's what an adjective does. So it it, strange, in English we wouldn't do no, that. No, you have to explain English. I mean, you have to explain in English Greek. Because Greek is a very colorful picture language. It describes and draws pictures. And... It draws action. Hebrew is even more of an action language than, than Greek is. But Greek tells you from where everything's coming. It's a beautiful perfection language of grammar. Grammatically perfect. 2 and verse 6. Hos. Un. Para labete. Tone. Riston. A son. Is tone, kirion, in, alto, peripatete. What is the word in Hebrew for to walk around? It means to spread yourself around in Hebrew. And I can't think of the word right now. So do what? So do you? It means to spread yourself around. It means to put tracks, make tracks in Hebrew. Um, to make tracks. Um, that word. Poetic. Yeah, it, I believe that is it. As, and now we have an adverb. All right, an adverb does what? Modifies, Modifies or describes or explains a action. All right. As, therefore, second person plural, second aorist indicative active. What's second aorist and first aorist? What's the difference between first and second aorist? What, I and you, you mean? No, first and second aorist. First and second aorist. Oh, aorist. Aorist. It's the form. Well, it's the form, all right, but what's the action difference in it? First aorist is what? Now, I've told you this before. One, one, <laughs> one of them is predictable, the other is not so predictable. One of them is more punctiliar than the other. That's what I was going to say. Yeah, punctiliar. What is punctiliar? All right, what's punctiliar? Point in time. It's you know what? When you're when an engine is firing, <laughs> when an engine is firing, and it's not firing, when you have a detonation, when you have carbon in the cylinder, to you two mechanic type guys, anybody else a mechanic in here? <laughs> when you have 
pre-detonation, you have second arrest. Because <laughs> you have a double fire or an elongated firing. And then you get what? What happens to your engine? It makes a little noise. Pings. Pings. Ah. All right? It's got the firing action too spread out. All right? It's too spread out because it's already hot. Too hot. Second arrest is a more, it's punctuality action, but it's elongated to some, it's spread out over a period of time. Second arrest. First arrest is like that. All right? That's a good time. <laughs> okay, I thought that maybe you might understand that just a little bit better if I said that. All right. As therefore ye received Christ, this is a, there was a time that we received Christ. The, the Christ, ton Christon, Jesus, the Christ Jesus. Now look at these words. This is the one and only Christ. No false Christ. Paul is just doing away with all the false Christ. He's talking about the Christ, Jesus. Jesus was the Messiah. He is the, in Hebrew, he is the, what's the word for Jesus in Hebrew? Yahshua. Oh, yes. Yahshua HaMashiach. All right? All right. He is the Joshua, the Messiah. That's what it says here. He is the specific one. He's specifically saying who the Messiah was. He's not somebody else. He's not all of... You know, Israel had many messiahs, didn't they? They had messiahs. One of them was called Bar-Jesus. What does Bar-Jesus mean? Bar-Jesus. The son of Jesus. The son of Jesus, or the son of Joshua. Literally. Which is Aramaic. Yeah, Aramaic. Bar-Jesus. But David was Mashiach. King David, because he was anointed. He's the anointed one. But there's one, ha, ha, the, ha. All right, ha, the one. Not just, yeah, ha, machine. All right, the Messiah. All right, and this is the Messiah, Christ, the Christ, the real Messiah, Jesus. Question. And then Tone Kirion. Yes. What? Is he assumed here in the genitive? The what? The genitive case. Tone? He, he assumed? No, it's 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 in the accusative. Oh, but I'm sorry, wait. It, it's in what? In gen it's it's an accusative. Okay. I'm yeah, it's an accusative case. Accusative, all these are accusative, so accusative, 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 accusative. Okay. All right, then it goes locative. All right. Hmm. We have Christ, accusative singular masculine, Jesus, accusative singular masculine, then we have another definite article, accusative singular masculine, and then we have kirion, accusative singular masculine. The word kirios now, in the Septuagint, the word Jehovah, we say that so easily, which we can't do, all right, the word, or Jehovah, it was translated kirios in so many places in Greek. So now let's see what, what Paul, what is he doing here? These people knew the Greek Septuagint, didn't they? Yes. Why isn't there a tone in front of his own? Because, the, because you don't have to re repeat it. Jesus is the Messiah. When you have one the, it describes everyone. You can have tone, crease tone, tone, a soon. It, it just doesn't have to be, it's there. It's a practical substantive in front of that noun. So it applies to both. It applies to both of them. You can put, yeah, just like, just like. But in that case, why is there another tone before kurion? He's repeating it because it's real important. <laughs> All right. You could have repeated it before. Yeah. But he didn't need to. Because it's a proper name. Yeah. He didn't need to. Because he tells you who the Messiah was. That's the name of the Messiah. Oh. So he didn't have to repeat it, but it actually was there. Yes. Oh, thank you. <laughs> Gotta have somebody <laughs> listen to it. <laughs> All right. All right. Hi, Hothios. Ain. Logos. 
Now, here we have the same thing. This is the end of John 1 and 1. And by the way, you can have it either way. It doesn't really matter. It's what you call a predicate nominative. So it doesn't matter which way it stands because the, it is the same on both sides. Okay? And the God kept on being, third person singular and perfect indicative active. This is the word they translate was, but it's actually <coughs> kept on being. And it's actually he kept on being, third person singular, and perfect, indicative, active, and then we have the word logos. Now this is nominative singular masculine, the definite article in it. Nominative singular masculine, noun, first person. Nominative singular masculine, and then we have third person singular, and perfect, indicative, active, and this, grammatically, the word ain is also an equal sign in math. Mathematically. And in grammar, the predicate nominative. Everything on this side and this side of this is one and the same. Number, gender, and case, they are the same one. Now, we have that repeated here in 2 and 6. Alright? And the God, or you could say, and whole logos, ain theos, or and chi, whole theos, and logos. It doesn't really matter which way you say it. Grammatically, it's exactly the same person. Number, gender, and case. Now, there is only one definite article there. But there really is two definite articles. Because you can put whole logos here because it's still this here. This and this are the same person. Number, gender, and and case. And this is what you call a predicate nominative. Are you in, in do you understand what predicate nominative? I understand, but I'm wondering what um, are you saying that that diacritical mark there is replacing the definite article? This this really stands there. It's there whether you realize it or not. That definite article is there. Now the Jehovah Witnesses say, and the word was a God put an indefinite article there. But you cannot grammatically do that at all. Because this the and this the here that's understood are the one and the same person. They are not two different people. God is God. Okay? God is God. That's the way you can say it. Now over here, it says the Christ Jesus, or the Christ is Jesus. Okay? The Lord, all right, the Jehovah, the Kyrios here, or the Kyrion, in accusing singular masculine, he is the Christ, and he is the Lord of heaven. He is the Jehovah. These people knew the Koine Greek language, and the word for Jehovah in Koine was Kyrios. Yes, Connie? Well, although, it's not the same. All these different <clears throat> gods, like Islamics and the uh, Buddhas and all this, this is not the same God that we are talking about. Is that right or not? Well, to the Buddhist, Buddha is God. And to the Islam, uh, Mohammed is, well, they, they believe in Allah, but Mohammed is his prophet. But this is okay. not the same. They don't worship it. That, is this not the same God that we, that we do? Oh. They don't worship the same God we do. Yes. yes. Actually, the word for Allah is the same is a transliteration, you could say, of Elo uh -huh. in Hebrew. Mm -hmm. So it is, it's the same word. Yeah. It's that, that Allah and, and El are the same words. They are, they are sister languages. And they do mean the same God. But they have a different idea of their God than we have. Of <coughs> the plural of Elo is Elohim. Elohim, yes. So, which you found in the Bible a lot, but you also find Elo mm -hmm. in a singular form. Yes. And that's the same as a law. Yeah. Mm -hmm. so okay, just, that's... They, they, they have a different word. They have yeah, but their idea of God... It's not the Bible teaches. Th that's not... not now, true. they accept the Old Testament. That's true. They do. The, the, the uh, Islam, or the Muslims, and some people call them Mohammedans, which really they don't like to be called Mohammedans. They're not followers of Mohammed. They say they're followers of Allah. All right? But, uh, and Mohammed was his prophet. But they changed. Instead of Abraham being, uh, Abraham's their father, 
Abraham's the father of their nation. But they say the promised son was Hagar's son, not Sarah's son. And they say that uh, Abraham offered Ishmael on Mount Moriah, not Isaac. They said that, that the Hebrew Bible was wrong and they changed it. But of course, they said this many years. When did Mohammed live? The 500s. 600. Yeah, 500 to 600. 1570, died 632. Yeah. At the end of the 500s and going into the 600s. Okay? That's when he lived. Now that's just a few centuries past the writing of the Old Testament. Now who do you think was right? You know, uh, Mohammed said he was sent by God to correct the Hebrew Bible. <laughs> I don't believe that. <clears throat> they can believe it all they want to. But their God is not the same God that we worship. Their, is, their God is a God of material pleasure. I keep hearing people call these uh, bombers and things cowards. These, you know, these people that go in and, and kill. They go in and load themselves up with bombs, grenades or whatever, and pull a pin and kill themselves and all these people. They say they're cowards. They're not cowards at all. They believe in what they're doing and they're dying for it. Okay? But why are they dying for it? Because they think when they leave this world, they're going to have 40 beautiful women waiting on them, peeling grapes for them, popping them in their mouth. They're going to live <laughs> by, the, by the big great paradise of God. They're going to be issued right in there with all of and they're going to be laying out there having a great time instantly. And they wake up in hell. Instead, their idea of, of heaven is eternal Sexual pleasure and material, eating, drinking, and being married. Yes. Actually, if you'll forgive me, um, I would disagree with that interpretation. Yusuf Ali, who is a well-known uh, interpreter of the Quran, uh, interprets those verses as very spiritually, mm -hmm. and and uh, uh, you know. There's really, there are, there are verses in the Quran which you would have to say are very spiritual in relation to paradise. It's not just, it's no more physical than Christians view heaven. That they say that. I've got a real good tape for you to listen to that try to convert Christians to I, I worked on a guy for about five or six years trying to convert him to Christianity and he was trying to convert him convert me to the Islam all the time. Well, I listened to everything he had to say. Boy, I mean, he poured all kinds of literature on me and stuff. <laughs> and I read all this kind of stuff. That's my accumulation of what I have learned about that theory. Now, what they say, their translation says, of course, it's going to be very biased to what they say it is. And their idea of this heaven is very spiritual to them. <coughs> but... In reality, when you go and you find out, have you ever been over there to the palaces that they have built? Well, as oh. it happened, I've worked in Saudi Arabia for over a year. Yeah. So yes, I've okay. seen palaces. So you've seen the palaces. You've seen the beauty of, of the, and their craftsmanship absolutely is beautiful. And these people believe in Allah. They will die for Him. I mean, it's not something... If, if you had to comp compare our faith with their faith, we are losers, the way we believe. But it's on the wrong track. They got on the wrong track. But it's not by lack of faith, it's not cowardice, it is wrong information. Simple. What? They're being duped by the devil. Well, they have. Well, God in, in the Old Testament prophesied their being. Now, believe it or not, God blesses them. Why does God bless the Arab people? Why does He bless these people? He told Abraham He blessed them. That's right. It is a what we call an unconditional covenant. An unconditional covenant. God told. Remember when Hagar went out there with Ishmael and she was bawling and squalling and ready to die, and He said, "I hear you." Out of him will come many princes. I'll make him as the sands of the sea because of Abraham. 
And that's exactly why they exist today. But by God's permissive will, God has allowed it. In eschatology, as we look at... Well, I went on too long tonight. I should have known when I... That thing clicked over there. I've been <laughs> rattling on for quite a while. Uh, I'm going to have to quit. <laughs> Hold on just a minute. God has allowed many things. God allows them to bring about His ultimate eternal purpose. His unpreventable progress. And that's how I'm going to end you tonight. God allowed Satan to rebel. God allowed Satan to destroy this material world that we live in today. The animals on the earth, the, the whole crust of the earth was is topsy-turvy. It was destroyed at that time. But guess how God used that wicked act to bring about drawing everybody into Saudi Arabia and over in that area. What is drawing them there? What is the drawing point? It's greed. <laughs> and it's spelled O-I-L. <laughs> That's what the greed is, is spelled. And how did it get there? Fossil fuel. And it's probably the best fossil fuel in the world. Why do you think God allowed that, that to happen? Now, what? who are the combatants in the end time? The sons of Abraham are in combat. That's what's drawing all of the problems over there. These boys are still fighting. They're still fighting. God said that the, the Arab descendants would be like wild donkeys. How many of you ever had anything to do with wild donkeys? Wild donkeys are quite different than tame donkeys. Tame donkeys you can trust not always. Tame donkeys, I mean, you can put a, a, a pack on, them, on their back over there, you can see them back, you can't even see the donkey. That thing's packed up with stuff like this, and that little fellow just goes right on his way, you don't hardly have to even guide him. You load him up and send him home. And he'll just do what he's supposed to do. Is it a donkey or a mule? A donkey. Oh. A mule is a half horse and a half donkey. Right, I know. A donkey is a donkey. But a wild donkey, that's what they call the wild ass in the Bible. Okay? Now they are mean. They are cantankerous. They do not get along with each other and they fight everything that comes in their midst. They come after you with their mouth. They come after you with their teeth bared and their I mean they will try to drag you off of a horse. They'll try to run you down. Jim is that is a burrow the same thing as a donkey? That's right. A burrow now we have wild donkeys here. And these wild donkeys that come out of Death Valley, Saline Valley, Eureka Valley, all these places where they're out across the desert and stuff, now those rascals, they're almost impossible to tame. They fight each other, and they fight everything that gets near them. Where I live... And they got a mind of their own. <laughs> where I live, uh, the guy has a donkey he got from the government. Yes. And on, they, they come and check on him every year. This... Uh, Beulah, what a name for a donkey. She is a character, let me tell you. They're smart. Donkeys are smarter than a horse. Much smarter, they're intelligent, but they have a mind of their own. Mm -hmm. They have. They are no longer domesticated. Right. These little donkeys over there in the Middle East that have not gone wild, that have been domesticated for thousands of years, they are very, very trustworthy, and they, they, they are just like puppy dogs. They just go where they're supposed to. But these wild donkeys, like the descendants of Ishmael and all these other dudes. They don't get along with each other. They're always fighting each other. They're fighting each other over there all, all the time. Um, in response to your question earlier, uh, you might want to keep in mind, as far as suicide bombers go, it's forbidden in Islam because there's two major things that they do which are forbidden. One is suicide. That's the most horrendous crime in Islam is to commit suicide. So you're not allowed to commit suicide. And then secondly, you're not allowed to kill non-combatants, which is what they do. They go into a marketplace and they kill innocent civilians. Get on Completely a forbidden. Sound hadith in Islam that forbid this, but Muhammad himself said, don't do that. And they're doing it. So these yeah. are ignorant people who don't know their own religion. Yeah. Who do such things. But they believe. 
They are very religious and they will die for what they believe. They'll die to the last man. Thank you for your attention tonight. Hope you learned something from God's Word. And uh, it's good to have a good... Last week we had a very small class. Today we have a large class. We need another row of seats in here. There you go. It's good to have us. Brother, would you mind assist missing us in a prayer? Am I right? All right. Blessed Heavenly Father, we just thank you for the time that you've uh, created for us today to come together and learn more of your word and to, to uh, just realize more of uh, who you are and, and reveal yourself to us. And please bless us as we go on our way and keep, uh, keep you in our, in our midst as we go through our daily toils. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. 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 Thank you for being here tonight. If you want any of these classes on tape or CD, if you want to borrow them, you can. If you want to buy them, they're two dollars a piece. Are you just telling us?